So the next submission is an oral presentation by the NSERC Lake Whitefish Research Program is outlined in CMD 15H 2.116 and 2.116A. I understand that uh, Dr. Wilson will make the presentation. Please proceed. Good morning. The Lake Whitefish Research Program is a interdisciplinary and collaborative research program based at McMaster University and the University of Regina. And we are supported by funds from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada through a collaborative research and development grant. And our partner organization in this project is Bruce Power. Um, at McMaster University is my lab. I'm Dr. Joanna Wilson um, from the University of Regina. We have Dr. Richard Manzin here with us today, and Dr. Summers um, unfortunately was not able to be with us, but uh, Ms. Rebecca Eberts is here to speak on his behalf, and a number of our trainees are here with us as well that are directly involved in performing the bulk of the research. Our project has three main aims. Um, the first two are involved at looking at the effects of um, the cooling water discharge on lake and round whitefish embryos. This is the development period of the embryos that would reflect uh, any animals that are potentially spawning in the nearshore area where the cooling water is discharged. Um, one is to look specifically at elevated temperature and the effects of thermal shocks, and the second is to look at combined stressors, looking at chemical, radiological, and temperature stress in combination on developing fish. Most of our work on the, these two aims have been on lake, lake whitefish to date. This year, we started working on round whitefish. Our third aim is looking at population structure and habitat use from those fish that are, are, can be caught in the near shore area during spawning season. Um, and that's been completed on both lake whitefish and round whitefish from the very beginning. In this map, we show the area where we've done the bulk of our collections, particularly for our population um, and habitat use studies. We have eight zones that we've focused on, two that are cons we consider reference zones, one to the north and to the south of uh, the Bruce Power site, and six areas that we consider part of a potentially affected zone. We have sampled fish within these sites during spawning season. Um, with using a gill netting approach. We've also deployed um, temperature loggers as well as uh, embryos back into the field for a number of years and the reference sites and at, at some sites within the affected zone. Um, that's the first data that I'm going to show you here today. This is data from our temperature loggers from the 2013 to 14 field season. The site in blue, want, uh, site number one, is our southern reference site, and you can see that there is lower temperature and, and much less variability in temperature at that site compared to two sites that are near the Bruce A and Bruce B cooling water discharge. And so we see elevated temperature on average around uh, maybe three degrees higher than our southern reference site and more variable temperature um, in the places where the cooling water discharge is released. And based on mathematical models that we've developed for fish development, we would expect that fish that are, uh, are developing in those areas impacted by the cooling water, that they may hatch earlier. And this matches what we've done in the field with, or in the lab, with lab rearing experiments, where we don't necessarily see increases in mortality or developmental abnormalities with elevated temperature, but we do see changes in the time of the animals to hatch and their size at hatching. Now we have done some, some work on chemical stressors, and in this case we've focused on morpholine and sodium hypochlorite. Um, sodium hypochlorite, unless we're very, very high concentrations, way outside the range of anything that we found in the field, they don't appear to impact our lake whitefish embryos. Um, morpholine, uh, we can calculate an LD50 that's way above what we would ever expect in the field. Um, we do see some changes in both growth and time to hatch at 10 milligrams per liter. We have also done some uh, work on acute radiological stressors, um, taking embryos at different points of development and exposing them to short-term radiological exposure. This year, we're still in the process of crunching data where um, we've exposed embryos to chronic radiological stress throughout their whole development. And we found that early um, 
embryos are more sensitive, but that in general, like other fish species, the lake whitefish are fairly insensitive to radiological stress, so it takes quite high doses. We see increases in mortality at 5 to 10 grays. And then we've done some initial studies looking at combined stressors. These are primarily with acute stressors, for example, heat shock and radiation together, or morpholine and radiation together. And while we do see some interactive effects, meaning that effects larger than we might expect based on um, individual stressor experiments alone, that's only when we reach doses that are far above what's environmentally relevant, suggesting that for um, the receiving waters, that our single stressor experiments are sufficient to potentially predict effects. Richard? Uh, Dr. Richard Manzin, for the record. Uh, one focus of my research group is to understand the impact of stressors on embryonic and juvenile whitefish um, at the cellular level. The heat shock response is perhaps one of the most universal responses to stress, um, and that's to a wide variety of different stressors. <laughs> Organisms will produce heat shock proteins, which are fundamentally protective in nature in both stressed and non-stressed conditions. Some of our work to date have shown that in embryos or fry exposed to short-term stress of three or six degrees above ambient temperature, we do not see a heat shock response. And we only see a heat shock response when we expose embryos to higher temperatures of nine degrees. Celsius, and these are short-term exposures. In contrast, when we expose embryos to repeated three and six degree heat stress every three to six days, we do begin to see an elevation in heat shock proteins. But importantly, in these same embryos, we see an attenuated or reduced heat shock response when they're exposed to very extreme heat stress of 12 to 18 degrees, suggesting perhaps some protective effects. Collectively, the data indicate that both embryos and fry are able to initiate a heat stress response, which is protective in nature. Uh, Rebecca Ebert. So as Dr. Wilson said at the beginning, the last theme of our program is to assess the genetic structure and habitat use of fish in this area so that we can understand the impact of our findings in these previous themes. So our goal here is to determine if lake and round whitefish in the affected zone are in some way distinct from fish farther away from this discharge area. So we've assessed this in two ways. We've used microsatellite markers to compare um, genetic distinctness between these two areas. And then secondly, we've used stabilized tubes to look at whether fish in these areas are distinct in their habitat use. We've done this with fish that we've gill netted between 2010 and 2012, so around 300 individuals of each species. So for our genetic comparison, our microsatellite analysis showed that there is no genetic differentiation between fish in the affected zones and the reference areas. So here I'm reporting the FST values. Um, the closer an FST value is to one, the larger the genetic distinctness is between two groups. You can see that our values for both species are close to zero, implying no genetic distinction. So we conclude that lake and round whitefish in the affected zone are not genetically distinct from those in the reference areas. And then lastly, our comparison of habitat use with stable isotopes, we found that there was high overlap of carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 values for fish from reference areas and affected areas, implying that they're using similar habitat and prey sources. We found that isotopes were quite diverse, implying that these are a diverse group of individuals, possibly reflecting multiple um, areas of the lake and food webs. But we can conclude that lake and round whitefish habitat use is similar and reference in affected areas. So to date, we know that in this eight zone area, um, the fish here are genetically similar and they are also similar in their habitat use. We're now looking to expand this to compare this eight zone area to populations uh, further away from this discharge area throughout the lake. Thank you. Thank you.